In the 2015 movie, The Martian, Matt Damon plays a scientist who goes to Mars on a first manned mission to the Red Planet, and he gets stranded there. Only by his wit and his training and his perseverance does he survive long enough for the people back on Earth to find a way to get him back home. But imagine if the mission had been to go to Mars with no intention of ever coming back. Imagine leaving everyone and everything that you have known to go to a place where you will spend the rest of your living and surely your dying days on a desolate, hostile environment with no scenery but red rocks and red dust everywhere. Sounds like a depressing movie scenario, doesn't it? But that is actually the idea by one Dutch company called Mars One. The idea is to send four people in an initial colony to Mars by the year 2025, and I think they've moved that now to 2030, with new crews coming every two years. Mars will be their permanent home where they will live and work and study the planet for the benefit of science and exploration and supposedly the human race. Now, you'd think that they'd have a hard time finding people to sign up for a mission like this. <laughs> But when the initial call went out in 2013 for this, there were more than 200,000 people who applied to be one of these astronauts to go to Mars and not return. One of them that made the initial cut was a 50-year-old entrepreneur from San Francisco named Peter Felgentreff. He said, well, I'm willing to leave my wife behind and go on this trip. And she shares my curiosity. Besides, he said, I'll probably die on Earth anyway. Well, duh. <laughs> now, skeptics say that the mission is probably unsustainable at this point in time. An MIT analysis says that he thinks that people will start dying from oxygen-related problems about 68 days into the mission. And the other big thing is water. Because, I mean, you can only recycle your waste so many times. The technology just isn't quite there yet to make this a sustainable mission. It's intriguing, but it's terrifying proposition as well. A mission from which there is no return. Most of us, I think, would probably take a pass on it. But as followers of Jesus, we know that he has given us a similar sort of one-way mission. It's a mission that's not out of the world, but into the world for the purpose of making and colonizing citizens for the kingdom of God. In our text, Jesus is recruiting for this mission. It's an extremely dangerous mission from which there may be no return. It's a mission that one could lose everything and cost you everything, but... You were made aware of that before you made your pledge to be a follower of Jesus and a member of his kingdom, the church. Jesus is the leader and visionary for this mission and demonstrates to his potential crew how it will all work. In our gospel lesson in Matthew 9, 35, Jesus says that he went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and sickness. The crowds were living in an unsustainable environment. They were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. 
Israel's rulers, both kings and religious leaders, had failed them, leaving them lost in their sin and guilt with no assurance of grace, forgiveness, and righteousness before God. Jesus pointed to a new future kingdom, one that was breaking in through him already. Of course, he wasn't talking about a political kingdom. Jesus, when talking about the new kingdom, said it was the rule of God or the reign of God on earth. Geographical, yes. Political, no. And the use of the word harvest smacks of imagery of the end of time when Jesus would come and establish his kingdom on earth. But while he's doing this, he also realizes that the initial crew may be a little few in number. And so he asks them to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more workers into the harvest field. Now, most of the time we think that there's, Jesus is talking about pastors or teachers or other church workers, but if you look at the text, Jesus doesn't make that distinction. The text intimates that all citizens of God's kingdom will be laborers in the harvest field. Jesus' prayer was and continues to be a call that could lead to a one-way mission, a one-way ticket. But the destination for us is not a hostile, desolate environment. It's the kingdom of God, eternal life, communion with our Redeemer. And there's nothing frightening about that proposition. A few of the initial crew, though, uh, were called out by Jesus. In verses 2 to 4 of our gospel lesson, you heard the names of those people. A, a ragtag group of people, of 12 in all. Um, simple fishermen, a tax collector, a revolutionary, a, a loudmouth, and even a shifty betrayer among them. Jesus gathers them together to teach them the skills that they're going to need. He gave them authority over, uh, gave them authority over unclean spirits and he, to cast them out and to cure every disease and sickness. These, he says, are the skills necessary to bring the kingdom of God, the physical and spiritual healing that is a part of the new world order the physical and spiritual healing that will be total and complete when Jesus comes again at the end of time. They had been with Jesus for quite a while, and now it was time for vicarage. Time to put some of their skills and knowledge into practice. And so before sending them out on their mission after his ascension and Pentecost, he sends them out on a training mission, sort of like how Mars One has set up a fake planet on which they can work and test their skills and see how they handle working in, under such conditions. This training mission, the short-term mission trip that Jesus sends them on, was designed with several components. First, it had a specific target. Remember in the gospel lesson, Jesus says, don't go to the Gentiles and the Samaritans. Your target right now is the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You'll get to those other people later. It had a specific goal. The goal was to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, that the kingdom of God had come near that this good news was, would be a glimpse of what the world would be like through the curing of some diseases and the casting out of demons. It had a sustainability plan. We might expect the disciples to do a lot of logistical planning, but Jesus says, don't take gold or silver or money along with you. 
you're going to depend upon the hospitality of strangers. No extra clothes, no extra tunic, nothing. When you go into a town, depend on the hospitality of strangers, which was a way of God saying, you're going to learn to depend upon God's goodness for your life. And then it also had a realistic picture of the future. This mission is a dangerous one. This training mission would give them just a small taste of what was to come. They were going to be as sheep among the wolves. They will face danger from hostile winds, both religious and civil authorities. All this they would face and more. And all of the 11 of those 12 disciples eventually go on this world mission tour, one in which they wouldn't return. Most of them were killed in horrific ways. Some were exiled and banished from the people and the world that they knew and loved. But despite the risk, they went because they, like us, had seen and heard and believed the good news of Jesus. They, like us, had experienced God's love in Jesus when he made the once for all sacrifice for their sins and then given us that forgiveness through his word and sacrament. They, like us, have been empowered by the Holy Spirit, poured out on Pentecost, and now exhibited in the deeds, in the telling of the story of the good news of Jesus, growing God's kingdom. We are pioneers of the new world that God is bringing to bear. Colonists of the kingdom of God who then can point the way to others by our teaching and our example. This is the church's mission offered to us. The church of Jesus Christ. But you and I kind of live in a different world than what those initial crew people live in. They faced physical dangers and uh, opposition from rulers. The problem that we face is almost opposite of that. Because for us, the church is a safe and secure place from which we often use as a shield to look from behind at the darkness and trouble of the world. We think more of the church as that safe place that we gather with like-minded people and it's a temporary asylum from the troubles of the world. We see the church as a safe harbor, not as a training place uh, and a launching pad for the mission into the world. But God created the church to be where we are nourished and then sent on mission into the world. And since this is God's intent for the church, perhaps we ought to ask ourselves those same questions that were posed to the disciples. Who is our target? Who are the specific people in your sphere of influence, in the community around you that God has sent you on mission to interact with? What is your goal? What is our goal? Are we proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, both the present kingdom and the future kingdom of God, both in our words and in our deeds? What is the sustainability plan that we have? Are we hoarding the resources that God has given us sustaining the church as an institution? Or are we depending on God's daily bread for us and sharing our resources with those in need? What are we willing to risk? Are we willing to risk 
being at odds with the culture because of our faith? Are we willing to risk ridicule and persecution because we proclaim Christ and minister in ways that reflect his kingdom? Signing up for the Jesus mission can be a one-way ticket. The only promise that Jesus gave his disciples was the promise of a cross. And you know that a cross is a one-way journey. It is a one-way journey from which there is only one return. Resurrection. And the Lord of life who has conquered death is the only one that can make resurrection happen. As he put it, whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake will find it. 200,000 people are ready, so they say, to board a spaceship to Mars with no hope of return. Felgentreff says it's a risk worth taking because sometimes the outcomes are worth it. Jesus says there's no risk more worth it than the mission of the kingdom. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.